the most important part of the history of physical education is the most recent. American physical education has generally differed from that in other countries of the world, particularly Europe, in that it has had throughout the 20th century this emphasis on games and sports. We're not having sport for the benefit of man, we're using man and woman for the benefit of sport. The biggest challenge we have is to get students excited about leading healthy lifestyles. We're not very much of a moving society anymore. We're a sit still society. One of the themes throughout history with physical education has been the development of soldiers. Physical education is about helping every person become physically active for a lifetime. Now for this younger generation, this could be a generation that they actually are less healthy than their parents are. The connection between one's physicality and the values emphasized by society began to take shape in antiquity. The best representation of physical education from the Greeks comes from Plato and what he talked about in physical education in his book, The Republic. Plato got a lot of his ideas from Sparta. So Plato's an Athenian, but he's very influenced by the Spartan military model. And Plato argued that a person of good character would be the best soldier. This translates into a number of interesting characteristics in American physical education. Specifically, the whole idea that we can develop character through our physicality in a physical education program. The Greeks also admired the body for its own sake, as an expression of something beautiful. The Athenians were interested not only in military preparation as a uh, primary purpose of physical education, but also the, uh, uh, an appreciation of the aesthetics of the human body. This was part of uh, the golden mean. Uh, this balance between body, mind, and spirit. Like the Greeks, Roman society also believed in developing virtuous behavior through one's physicality. Rome uh, made sport much more of a spectator sport than Gre Greece did. Uh, but we, you know, we find the beginnings of sport there, and we find the sport being connected to the kind of society that those people wanted to maintain. During the Middle Ages, the emphasis shifted from one's body to one's eternal soul. Some important concepts, however, like competition and chivalry, evolved during this period. That period did uh, give us some of the ideas that we have today about fairness and honesty and duty and concern for others. Uh, and that's where we get this idea of the concept of, of chivalry. But in the Middle Ages, what really came about uh, was what we find today in literature as, as competition, and the idea of the medieval tournament. During the Renaissance, some of the ideas from antiquity were reborn. The unity of the mind and body became a dominant theme. It incorporates the ideas of the church from the Middle Ages. It incorporates the ideas of physicality from Plato, from the Greeks, from the Romans. During the Reformation, recreation and leisure activities were generally believed to be frivolous activities. For activities to be deemed valuable by the church, they needed to serve God and to have a direct or practical application to everyday life. The idea that God's time must be used wisely came to America with the arrival of the new American settlers. The Puritan and later Protestant work ethic are some examples of this influence on everyday colonial life. Recreation was thought to be valuable only if it could recreate or renew one's physical health and soul so a person would be more productive at work. Early colonial life was harsh. There was little time for leisure and recreational activities. Early American settlers did, however, value sports. New immigrants brought with them the various sports that were popular in their native countries. Sports began reflecting uniquely American characteristics. In addition to sports, education was something valued by American immigrants. In 1635, the Boston Latin School was established, and within a year, Harvard College opened its doors. However, physical fitness had not yet been incorporated into education. With the exception of Benjamin Franklin's Proposals for the Education of Youth and his Lone Voice in the Wilderness, there wasn't much physical education prior to the 1820s. 
one of the things that particularly interested him was, uh, was swimming. He felt it was a particularly important skill for all Americans. He was very much a proponent of physical activity. So we can call him one of our first uh, physical educators, but he certainly was a voice in the wilderness at the time. Health, fitness, and education began to come together in the 1820s when Joseph Cogswell and George Bancroft opened the Roundhill School in Northampton, Massachusetts. The Roundhill School modeled their physical education curriculum after a system of German gymnastics known in Germany as the Turner Movement. The German gymnastic system was created by Frederick Ludwig Jahn. Jahn was after the development of good Germans. He was tired of losing wars to the French in the early 1800s, so he wanted to develop German youths. What did he have at hand? Well, he had ropes. He had walls that he could build outdoors. He could develop or build a, uh, a rough simulation of a horse. It was to develop the body through hard work and discipline. The person hired to teach Jan's German gymnastics was Charles Beck. Charles Beck was the first formal instructor of physical education in this country. The Roundhill School was the first to make physical education an important part of an educational curriculum. The Roundhill School existed for a little over 10 years, but it is still regarded as one of the most important institutions in American sport and physical education prior to the 1860s. Unfortunately, access to schools like Roundhill were only available to a small number of people. General education for the masses was not yet available. Some towns provided education for boys, but few provided it for girls. The prevailing thoughts at the time were that women should only do physical tasks which would help them with domestic activities like cooking, cleaning, and child rearing. We weren't supposed to be able to do anything without fainting or having some sort of a problem, but it kind of evolved into uh, being able to do things that would help you uh, do the chores we women were supposed to do, you know, around the house, you know, the bending, the lifting, the washing. People were beginning to make the connection between exercise, movement, overall fitness levels, and health. The exercise programs which existed at the time were based primarily on either Jan's German gymnastic system or a Swedish gymnastic system developed by Per Heinrich Ling. Per Heinrich Ling integrated emerging knowledge of anatomy, physiology, and circulation into his Swedish gymnastics system. These programs and others like them were the foundation from which physical education evolved. In 1845, when Alexander Cartwright and some friends modified a children's game known as Rounders into the sport of baseball, the landscape of sports and games in America changed forever. Baseball became immensely popular and uniquely American. It helped to influence popular opinion of recreation, sports, games, and fitness. At about the same time, Matthew Vassar opened his college for women, which incorporated Mary Lyon's concepts of organized physical exercise. Mary Lyon founded Mount Holyoke College and was a pioneer in developing institutions of higher education for women. Catherine Beecher continued to be an advocate for women's health. Her brother, the famous Reverend Henry Ward Beecher, was an advocate of the English muscular Christianity movement. Muscular Christianity almost looked at sport as not having any downside. The idea that certain values and principles could be taught through rigorous physical activity was beginning to take root in America we could teach sportsmanship values to go along with healthy bodies and physical activity and combine all that with religious principle. Young men were expected to follow the principles of muscular Christianity while young women were expected to be submissive, domesticated, pure of heart, and pious. Gymnasiums began opening throughout America to promote physical fitness for men and women. The contribution of gymnasiums to health and fitness expanded with the work of Dudley Allen Sargent. After the Civil War, Dudley Allen Sargent started the Hygienic Institute and School of Physical Culture in New York. Not only was he a medical doctor uh, and a physical educator, but he was an inventor. Dudley Allen Sargent invented several physical fitness machines and exercises to help promote health and fitness. Many of Dudley Allen Sargent's inventions are still prevalent to this day. In 1861, at the start of the Civil War, Dr. Diocletian Lewis founded the Normal Institute for Physical Education, a 10-week program for teaching men and women about his system. 
His exercises could be done by anyone at home or in the classroom. He was especially concerned with fitness for the non-athlete. Dr. Lewis was also a prolific writer and became a strong advocate for making physical training part of an educational curriculum. As the American public school system began to develop, people recognized the importance of fitness and being physically educated. The idea of physical education being educational and not just for fitness and not just for military training and not just for exercise or just recreation, the idea that it was a, a truly important part of a person's education came about in America. Physical education was first incorporated into a college and university curriculum. An issue, however, was there were few people qualified to teach physical education at the time. Educators turned to medical doctors. Physical education was started really by, by MDs, uh, by medical doctors who saw a real reason in universities to teach people how to take care of their bodies. In 1861, Amherst College appointed Dr. Edward Hitchcock as professor of hygiene and physical education. He was good at what is known as uh, anthropometric measurements, measuring um, chest, girth, uh, waist, height, weight, uh, strength. And then he developed uh, physical activity programs that, would, uh, that were somewhat tailored to individual needs. Dr. Hitchcock's physical education program was a model for other college and university fitness programs throughout the country. While interest in physical fitness grew, the popularity of sports also began to rise. The popularization of physical education and the development went hand in hand with the popularization of sports. Rowing was one of the most popular sports at the time, and in 1853, when Yale and Harvard competed in the first intercollegiate rowing contest, a new era in intercollegiate sports and physical education had arrived. As America industrialized and as more people started moving into the cities, many of the big city problems began to emerge. Large population increases, inadequate waste disposal, epidemic diseases, poor factory conditions, and a variety of other causes made 19th century city life unhealthy. Social reformers became concerned with the decline in health and fitness levels in American society. Many things occurred, however, that helped make physical fitness available to everyone. The advent of public parks and urban recreation facilities helped to increase the access to fitness, games, and recreation for everyone. It really became an important part of the connection of recreation to physical education. The YMCA and YWCA began devising recreational activities to help meet America's growing need for fitness facilities and programs. The YMCA also built and developed one of the best physical education programs in the nation uh, at Springfield College. Luther Gullick, a superintendent of physical training at the YMCA Training School in Springfield, Massachusetts, was committed to using games and sports for educational purposes. From this commitment, he requested that James Naismith develop a new indoor recreational game to captivate the interests of the young men at his school. James Naismith, a YMCA instructor, devised a game utilizing a soccer ball to be passed back and forth. The sport of basketball was born. The game was an instant hit. Basketball contributed greatly to the growing popularity of sports and helped make sports more accessible to the masses. The YMCA was also instrumental in inventing volleyball. William Morgan, a physical director at YMCA in Holyoke, Massachusetts, created a game to meet the needs of his noonday businessmen's fitness class. Like basketball, volleyball became immensely popular. As sports and games became more accessible and available to the average American, so did education. As the United States grew, public education became more of a reality for everyone. No longer was it going to be uh, satisfactory for only the children of the elite to be educated. By the turn of the century, the majority of states had enacted legislation making school attendance mandatory through the sixth grade. The progressive educational movement had also started at this time. John Dewey of the University of Chicago was the leader of this movement. John Dewey was uh, one of the best proponents, most vocal proponents of the American philosophy of pragmatism. And uh, his ideas of pragmatism and progressive thought had a huge impact 
on American education. Dewey believed in educating the whole child, and he felt that play and games had a key role in the education of youth. When we educate people, we educate the whole person. I think t still today, the only place that concerns a holistic approach to educating the total child is the physical education class. The face of American education had changed dramatically. PE expanded with the growth of general education. To meet the growing demand for physical education instructors, private teaching training colleges began developing PE training programs. All of these first schools were private enterprises. There was a man by the name of Anderson at Yale who started one. Uh, Dudley Allen Sargent at uh, Harvard started a summer school of physical education which was very in influential for a number of years. The kinds of Turner gymnastics and things that went on were fairly free-flowing kinds of movement. Dudley Allen Sargent trained new physical educators at the Sargent Normal School. Philanthropist Mary Hemingway founded the Boston Normal School of Gymnastics and stressed Swedish gymnastics. These schools were popular and trained many of the early female pioneers in physical education. One of the neat things I think about the early time was that there were women early on when there weren't very many women at the universities in general, but there were women hired to deal with physical education as soon as there were women in the colleges. And some of those people really, uh, I think, set the pace for this being a part of, become, of educating people for their lifetime. Mabel Lee, Delphine Hanna, Amy Morris Homans, these are women physical educators who are training other professors in our colleges. Delphine Hanna taught at Oberlin College and was instrumental in training many of the prominent physical educators at that time. In 1892, Oberlin College established a two-year program in physical education called the Normal Course in Physical Training. Between 1900 and 1917, the private schools along the Eastern Seaboard continued to be the main source of qualified physical educators for the United States. Eventually, however, the four-year public and private universities would replace the normal private teacher colleges. In 1885, the American Association for the Advancement of Physical Education, or AAPE, met. It was one of the first associations which dealt specifically with the issues facing physical education. The big debate at that time was which gymnastic model, Swedish or German, produced the best results for American youth. The subject, however, eventually became moot as the popularity of sports entered the U.S. school system. What happened in part was uh, sport became very popular and it was seen as a really good way to be physically active. And so rather than just do exercises in terms of being physically active, one way to get that same physical activity was through sport activities. So sports and games came in as a very pleasurable way to get the physical exercise that people needed. The Swedish and German gymnastic exercise programs were dull when compared to the excitement of competitive sports. Sports eventually replaced gymnastics in most PE programs. There were all of these competing systems, foreign systems, that were trying to hold sway, German gymnastics, Danish gymnastics, and so forth. And eventually, as we ended up with this American system, which included sport. As the number of public schools increased, interscholastic sports became the focus for many communities throughout the country. The popularity of intercollegiate sports introduced people to the fun and excitement of games and athletic competition. Almost all other countries in the world don't include competitive sports in the schools. Most of the world has club sports and we introduced physical education into the curriculum as being an educational enterprise and important and our physical education system in this country is mainly centered around sports and games. At the beginning of the 20th century, one of the most popular spectator sports was football. Football becomes the dominant institutionalized model of organizing our physicality in American culture. Football coaches become our physical educators. However, the injuries and fatalities that plagued the game raised serious questions about whether or not football would continue. In 1905, President Theodore Roosevelt applied pressure to colleges and universities to regulate football and college athletics. The Intercollegiate Athletic Association of the United States was created. In 1910, this organization became the NCAA. Football helped to reinforce the values that society desired in American males. The whole idea of sport being connected to masculinity 
and the American character was, was really promoted by Theodore Roosevelt at a time that uh, maybe our country needed that. But were sports and physical education really committed to the same goals and values? Or was this alliance headed for trouble right from the start? Interscholastic athletics in the schools has actually hurt the average physical fitness of American youth. Just because you're in sports shape when you're growing up does not mean you're going to be in physical shape when you get older. Plato argued that physical education is good, but athletics in and of itself is too narrow. When you have a winner, somewhere there's going to be a loser. By definition, athletics is a zero-sum game. Oftentimes, um, you might find somebody that uh, maybe is a coach and has knowledge about a certain sport, but as far as uh, teaching physical education, they might fall short on that. For better or worse, sport and physical education began to overlap in the public school system. By 1917, physical education was poised for unprecedented growth. Between World War I and World War II, sport, fitness, dance, and physical education had become an important part of the educational system in the United States. One of the reasons that physical education is so important is that it, it touches every child in the country. The public school system is that one system that uh, can make a difference uh, with lots of people. More and more universities were requiring physical education for graduation. The American Physical Education Association developed a growing interest in PE research. One of the most significant research facilities at the time was the Harvard Fatigue Lab. Although that laboratory is closed today, it was only open for 20 years, it was the foundation that started all of the exercise physiology laboratories in this country. While fitness was gaining acceptance as a bona fide scientific research topic, sports continued to gain in popularity. Sports and PE programs could teach young men and women how to ultimately be better citizens. We want to make good citizens in all aspects of American life. We use football to develop character, football to develop citizens, track to teach discipline, uh, swimming to teach work ethic, and this becomes part of the American physical education experience. Everything we touched, we made a little bit more American, and we had the Americanization of the whole sports system. Sports and physical education were so closely linked that at some colleges and universities, intercollegiate athletic programs were placed within a physical education department. Another significant factor which influenced PE was the advancement of dance. Margaret Dubler was a pioneer in incorporating the fundamentals of dance and human movement into PE. Her work was the foundation for American movement education in the 1960s. Prior to World War II, the focus for PE programs varied significantly. In the 1930s, three men, Jesse Firing Williams, Jane Nash, and Charles McCloy, proposed three very different directions for physical education. Jesse Firing Williams felt that the goal of physical education was to develop character. He wanted students to learn activities which could be used later in life during their leisure time. Dr. Jesse Firing Williams, uh, the last of the medical doctors uh, that were in physical that were physical educators, was also at Columbia University, but he became the primary theorist of the 1920s, 30s, and 40s. Jay Nash believed that physical activities should focus on specific objectives such as vocational skills and lifelong leisure time activities. Nash is arguing for the skilled use of leisure time and this is what helps make you be a good citizen. It's in that free time where we can flower as citizens. Charles McCloy felt that if PE could train and develop the body then that would be a sufficient objective in itself. He wrote a wonderful article titled How About Some Muscle and he said just lifting weights and exercising was good enough. That's all you need to do in a good physical education program. Another factor that influenced the variety and availability of PE programs was various state, local, and municipal resources. The Depression negatively impacted the growth and availability of PE programs across the country as they were either scaled back or cut. Between 1932 and 1934, about half of the institutions in America dropped all physical education and sport. 
The sporadic and inconsistent availability of nationwide PE programs became very apparent during the World War II draft. Over one million men were rejected for service due to poor or substandard fitness levels. This was a wake-up call to state legislators to put more resources into physical education. Every time throughout uh, American history uh, there has been a war, there has been a corresponding development of physical education support. After World War II and then the Korean War and the Cold War period, um, we saw high school and college students having required physical education. America was again embarrassed when the Claus Weber tests compared fitness levels of American youth with those of European children. European children won hands down. Out of that concern over that, that result grew an emphasis on physical education that bolstered the field during the 1950s uh, and the early 60s. People blamed the poor fitness performance on what they felt was an overemphasis on sports in the physical education curriculum at the time. Our programs turn, turned into physical training programs and uh, so you saw big fitness programs for a long, long time. I think that you still see the drill sergeant up in front of the class. The last four decades of the 20th century were witness to profound and dramatic change in physical education. When John F. Kennedy became president, the American public wanted to emulate the young, active, and vibrant Kennedy family. Ken Cooper's aerobics and fitness movement played a major role in increasing the popularity of exercise and fitness for the average American. The expansion of fitness was really went back to Ken Cooper in the late 60s or the early 1970s. His programs helped shape a generation of fitness enthusiasts and his influence is still keenly felt to this day. Sports continue to gain in popularity in physical education classes across the United States. But prior to 1972, there was still a big gap between men's and women's competitive sports. In 1972, Title IX helped to level the playing field of men's and women's competitive sports. Title IX has been tremendously important in terms of, of physical activities um, for girls in particular. Uh, the Title IX says a couple things. One is that, that no institution that receives federal funds can discriminate in any of its programs but in terms of gender. Then on the other hand, Title IX works just the other way. There are some schools that, where the, uh, the males were lacking and Title IX has also allowed them to catch up. PE for men and women were combined. In addition to Title IX, other legislation helped to clear the way for sports and physical education to be available to everyone including special populations. Public Law 94-142 is one that comes immediately to mind that um, was for children with special needs and started the whole process of saying these children need to be included in all areas of the curriculum. I'd like to think of physical education as adapted physical education because all the students are different. They all have different abilities and capabilities. The scope, depth, and breadth of physical education has expanded significantly in the 20th century, arguably more than any other academic discipline. The two things that have advanced the fastest has been computer science and I think exercise science. The physical education teacher is being asked to do so much more than he or she ever had to do before. Some of the tremendous advances made in fitness have come you know, in the last 20, 30 years from a research standpoint and I think physical education instructors um, today the the science that they need to have the understanding of the human body um, is a lot greater than it you know than it than it used to be there have been people that have had a vision for physical education um, over the last generation that have been really important one of them was Kate Barrett she was at the University of North Carolina and she had a vision of people being competent movers. Don Olopiano uh, has been a big advocate for women in sport. Another factor that helped the growth and development of physical education was the formation of various associations. NASPE, National Association for Sport and Physical Education, is made up of 18,000 uh, professionals across the country in physical education, sport, higher education, who are interested in furthering the profession. NASPE has provided uh, 
us with criteria for elementary, middle school, and high school programs. In the promotion of health and physical education and recreation in this country, uh, one organization that has been on the front lines since 1885 is the American Alliance for Health, Physical Education, Recreation, and Dance. Starting in the 70s and coming on up until now, there's been more and more of a movement towards purposeful physical activity that includes everyone. Like they have throughout history, the values of American society will be reflected in the types of physical education programs we develop or don't develop. Physical educators are still wrestling to keep physical education in the schools, especially at the elementary levels. I don't think physical education has moved too far up the ladder of importance in the school system. Obesity levels in the United States are increasing um, dramatically and <clears throat> you know obesity is related to two things. I mean, it's related to energy expenditure and it's related to energy intake. I think the biggest challenge is getting people to do it. Kids are just getting fatter and more out of shape. We're competing so much with, with computers and, and things that kids can stay sedentary in the house with. I always think there needs to be more physical activity for the kids during the day. One of the big challenges facing physical educators today is the perception um, in the world that schools are for academics. We need to educate uh, the public about physical education and what it is. I would like to see a profession that is concerned about providing developmental physical activity for people of all ages from womb to tomb. It's our nature to be physically active. It's our society in many ways that teaches us to be physically inactive. The direction physical education takes in the 21st century will depend on many factors, not the least of which will be the value that American society chooses to place on it.